Hey, it's Don Coscarelli, filmmaker. I uh, just wrote a book. Check it out. It's called Fiction, Tales from the World of Phantasm. And uh, it can teach you all the things that you never knew about the Phantasm film series. A lot of interesting stuff. Horror, violence, not much sex. Check it out. Now available on Amazon, paperback, and Kindle. This is The Gala Show. I'm your reporter on the beat, Gala Avery. On this episode, my listeners know my connection to Pulp Fiction, and they know that a lot of people really love that movie. But do they love it enough to steal it? That's the premise of the new film, Stealing Pulp Fiction, starring Cassie David, John Rudnitsky, Karan Sony, and Jason Alexander. Not only did the characters plot to steal the reels of Pulp Fiction, but this movie also managed to steal my heart. Today on The Gala Show, I'm joined by the writer, director, and man behind Pillisdorf Social Club, Danny Turkowitz. Hey, Danny. Thank you for having me, Gala. You are very, very welcome. A lovely intro. Thank you. (laughs) You are very welcome for my lovely intro. Yes. Um, So before we bring up the topic for today, I have a very serious question for you. Wow. What is your favorite movie? Um, It's not Pulp Fiction. Wow, but that's shocking, okay. shocking. Um, How I've could actually you? never seen it. Uh, no. No, I have to say it. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to be like, oh, you fraud. No, I've seen it a few times. Um, favorite movie, this feels like the letterbox. Uh, yeah. Know, for, for, my, my thing, though, is like, what's your favorite movie right now in this moment? Because it could change like in an hour when we're talking. You'd be like, you know what? Actually, my favorite movie right now is... I can do also my favorite Tarantino movie, then also yeah, favorite sure, movie. Yeah, sure, why not? Why not? Okay, what's your favorite Tarantino Inglorious Bastards. Okay, that's easy peasy. Yeah, it's, it's easy peasy. Maybe I shouldn't have said that. But <laughs> uh, favorite movie probably is I'm gonna go with Rushmore today. Okay. That's She's today. not. She doesn't like the answer. <laughs> it's not that I don't like the answer. I appreciate. Well, it I has appreciate. a history for me. Okay, what's the history? The you know when I was toying with the idea of wanting to make films, they like showed this movie to us in film camp, and I was like, How oh, like you? I. Like 13, maybe. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I was just like a movie that I was like, oh, I didn't know you can make these kinds of movies. Uh, like, you know, the style or whatever. But, and yeah, I feel like obviously now my style is like influenced by his movies. So. Yeah, I see that actually um, now that you pointed yeah. it out. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, right now it's Rushmore. But it's definitely always, if I would do a top 10, definitely a Wes Anderson would be Wes in there. Uh, mm, I think my favorite Wes Anderson is Bottle Rocket. Oh, yeah, yeah, but which I is love, so I love, similar to the Steel and Pulp Fiction. Yeah, because yeah. I love crime gone wrong. Yeah, exactly. Gone right, gone right, wrong. Right. So I mean, Steel and Pulp Fiction was right up my alley when that. And did it go right or wrong? It went right. Right, because they all because got it what went they wrong. Want. <laughs> yeah, because, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, definitely. Yeah, bottle. Ro- I mean, the Darjeeling also I think mm-hmm. is like the most simple, but most like has the most like emotion in it. Mm-hmm. Um, but right now, Rushmore. Right now, Rushmore. Even though I haven't seen it in years. But it's just always like... You don't have to see a movie recently for it to be one of your favorites. Like Prince of Darkness is my favorite Carpenter probably. Uh, It's the scariest movie I've ever seen. I saw it when I was like 13. I will never watch it again. I saw the trailer at the Bev and I had to like close my eyes and like hold my face. I'll never watch it again. Were they playing at the the Bev? They were just playing the the trailer. I was terrified. Absolutely scared out of my wits. I actually, weirdly enough rewatch the Darjeeling trailer a lot. Somehow it's uh, one of the trailers I rewatch along with the social network. So Now, as always, my guest gets to bring their topic to the mic. Danny, why don't you tell us what your topic is and why you decided to choose it? <laughs> well, to preface, I didn't know it could be any topic. <laughs> it so could be I, any topic. I, I thought it had to be film related, but should we go into the journey of how I got it. Well, you, we were saying maybe tennis. We can talk yeah, about. Yeah, because you love tennis. But I, love, and I tennis. love tennis. I'm also wearing a Knicks shirt because they're playing in general, sports. You're a sports guy. You know, I don't just love films. I like to be athletic. Yeah. Um, you're not just a nerd. I'm not just a film. Well, <laughs> here's a good here's a good segue. I grew up playing sports a lot with Kevin, my roommate, who's listening in. Hi, Kevin. Shout out to Kevin. Um, but so like my whole childhood was kind of soccer. Or Basketball, Little League, so, you know, but I, I sucked at baseball. And, like, I went to, like, a traditional 
summer sleepaway camp that was very sports heavy. Um, and they had a very small like film program at the summer camp. I got very into that. And I was the one I was making like the film, you know, videos for color war and stuff like that. And realized like, Oh, there's actually like summer camps that are just for film and I don't have to just do sports because, you know, at the end of the day, I knew I wasn't going to be a professional soccer player or anything. The job track wasn't mm -hmm. likely. So, yeah, I decided to do like a summer camp in Burlington, Vermont. That was just And that's where film. you saw Rushmore, I'm guessing. And that's where I saw Rushmore. Well, that's actually perfect. Why it was Burlington, I actually still don't know. You gotta um, phone your mom after and ask. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think like it, there were different options, like... And me and my friend, I did it with a friend at the sleepaway camp I went to, and we picked Burlington. I don't know why, but it was very nice, a great, great area. And then, yeah, ever since then, I did, uh, you know, I went to film school, did even in high school film programs, like over the weekends at New York Film Academy. And yeah, went to Emerson and then moved out to LA. But before we get into the topic, now is the time for commercial break. <laughs> vegetarian but that doesn't mean i can't enjoy a good spice rub my favorite place to get them is smoked bros a veteran owned and operated business that sells premium handcrafted dry rubs spice blends and seasonings Psst, guys you can even put it on your popcorn my favorites are honey badger because he doesn't give a bleep and jelly and peanut flavor topping because mm, 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 some things just taste better together the website even has recipes, so go check out smokedbros.com to support a veteran-owned and operated business and fill your cabinet with delicious flavor. And we're back. You heard it here. We're going to be talking about kind of the journey to filmmaking. I have 30 minutes on the clock and our time starts. Oh, now it now. starts. Yeah. You're like Eli. Well, I just told you. I just told you the whole story. <laughs> no, that's not the whole story. I mean, okay. So I talked with one other person kind of about this who had their life as a jock and then a lot of their Why friends. Why would I? Not, I well, I don't know. I might I'm, consider you just based on your looks right now right. wearing your Knicks shirt. Well, they're playing tonight. They're playing tonight. Um, okay. But... Yeah, sorry. We're, I was going to say we're, that they had their life as a jock, and then when they transitioned kind of into being a creative, a lot of their friends, it was kind of a separation of personality. But I don't think you have that as much. Uh, yeah, I mean, I also think a big factor, too, like my parents were never into sports, really. Like, mm -hmm. I think a lot of my other friends' fathers were always, like, the, they're the coaches, and, like, they would be up, they grew up huge basketball or, you know, football fans, and my dad was never really that into sports not to call him out on that but but he did take me to a tennis match once so maybe that's my love for tennis but yeah so I think that played like they were really into just watching movies on the weekends and going to the movies um they still obviously brought me to the soccer games and mm -hmm. supported that um where did you grow up Long Island Long Island how yeah. long did you stay in Long Island my whole, Your whole childhood. childhood. Although my parents recently moved into the city, into New York City. Wow, they don't most people move from New York right. to Long Island? Yeah, okay. they, uh, yeah, they're party animals. They're they're going out to, to <laughs> rooftop bars and stuff. But yeah, they sold the house. They they did you know did not sell the memories, obviously. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so now every time when I go back to the East Coast, it's to the city, which is which is great. But. Yeah, which is great. Yeah. So you were in Long Island. And you were at summer camps, and you're at sports camps that had a film program. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't it wasn't really a film program. It was like just like someone needed to make the films for the camp. So you kind of started out making like camp sports films because there's some, there's people that start out doing skate movies. A lot of directors right. actually started out doing skate. There were there were more honestly like a group of like like the four 
funniest people. I'm, I'm not saying that I was one of, one of those, but the four I think like you are. The, the, the four funniest people that weren't maybe the best at sports would make these videos that were like four color war of like more like sketch stuff mm-hmm. and like over the top. I mean, I'm trying to even think like there, there's no storyline or, or really? whatever. But yeah. um, do you still have them? The camp does somewhere. Oh my God, you should dig archives. those out. You should dig those out. That would actually be a great premise for a movie. If you dug those out and then you had the four guys come back together. Years later. Years later. And you could use all that footage. This is part of like the stealing, uh, <laughs> stealing. You know, anthology <laughs> movies. Stealing camp movies. Yeah. Um, but no, they were never good. I mean, they were they were more like, they would only be funny or fun for the, I don't even think the rest of the camp found it funny. Like it was just. It was just for you It was guys. just for us. Yeah, so anyway, yeah, so, but I still, yeah, love still playing sports, though, yeah, so. Do. do you keep in touch with those guys? Um, no, but yeah, my three closest, my two closest friends from, like, film camp, mm-hmm. I'm doing air quotes for some reason, but it, it was film camp. Um, yeah, one of them just wrote, like, a play that did very well off Broadway, and then another one is doing, like, stand-up in New York, so. We're all still well, that little going out. incubator kind of worked. Then, yeah, I think. I mean, Burlington I went, pumps them out. I went to a film camp uh, at Pepperdine for oh. two years. I did a, I did two years at Pepperdine film camp. I don't know. And like, you still keep in touch with? Did Pepperdine pump them out too? One, you know, I keep in touch with one guy, and he, yeah, he's like a producer now. And oh. so, yeah, I think it did work out. His name's Brendan. So, Brendan, if you're listening, well, you I know. think the P. Hey, Brendan. Um, <laughs> I think that if you were that young and knew you wanted to go to something like film camp, mm-hmm. you like you knew you were in it for the the long haul. Like. Well, when you're like 13 and you're like, I really love making yeah. movies. I mean, even like you like you know, for some reason, uh, in high school and middle school, like Spanish class, for, mm-hmm. I don't know why, would make you do videos always for projects. Yeah, they would. And so I was always the one that would would make the videos and have everyone you know act in it. And those I have somewhere too, which I don't oh. think will you know, <laughs> hold up. God, uh, my my old ones. Uh, I did it with my childhood best friend who was named Aurora, and we used to make this thing called Extreme Baby, and it was this, okay. it was like Jackass but with a, a baby doll, and we used to make the baby do extreme stunts. Like that was our extent of filmmaking back then. Yeah, I, we. I mean, I have no idea where those are. We did some stunts type of stuff at this <laughs> with, with uh, a baby Kevin's doll. Was at the Andrew Haft's <laughs> house. Thank you, Andrew Haft, for hosting us to do these like crazy i don't even want to like i don't know what we were doing but vile thing like (laughs) just boy things yeah just and we would film it and like edit it on iMovie and god um, oh my god yeah iMovie what iMovie and garage band were a huge part of growing up Uh, so when did you know you wanted to apply to emerson was it emerson specifically um yeah it was emerson or i mean i knew i like any film school, really. I mean, I was originally at a time going to go to, um, what is it called? Uh, SVA. But it was like, SVA was weird because it was like literally just, fi- like it was almost like a trade school. Mm-hmm. Like you didn't have to do any other classes. Like Emerson was at least more of a, a normal college that had like a good film program. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, so I did that. And that's where I met a lot of the people that I'm like working with now these days. So. It's great because I hear some people like there's an argument for and against film school. Like there's a camp of people that are like, it's really, really good for networking. And then there's a camp where it's like, it's a waste of money. It's probably at the end of the day, a waste of money. But the biggest takeaway was the people I met there or the people that I'm collaborating with. Like even like the classes, which were great, they were more or less the same stuff that at the same exact class in, in the film summer camp. Uh, which was interesting, but like, yeah, they're not really teaching you. And this is not for me to bash, you know, Emerson or, you know, but, uh, they don't really teach you anything you need to know about what it, it actually really takes to make it. Yeah. Like, well, cause you can, you can teach someone all you want, but you don't know until you're on set. Right. And a lot of people who have not made a movie before don't understand how difficult it is to make a movie it right. is like going to war it's they don't it's fun they don't really teach you how to make a movie as yeah. crazy as that sounds they kind of more teach you like why would you use blue in this shot like film theory yeah like which is great but like to make a feature is 
to like actually make a feature, they don't teach you how to do that. Like of like f- financing and legal. The Which amount, is funny. I know. think that would be the most important thing to learn. Right. And even like, you know, set stuff they don't teach you and like just set etiquette. And uh, yeah, I, I was an intern, like a camera intern on a feature that was filming in Boston one summer. But, like nothing to do with Emerson. And, and I learned like way more on that than in any class. Um, yeah, it's a lot of like film history they teach you, which is great. But like in no way does it prepare you to move to LA and w- want to make a movie and like figure out how to make a movie. Yeah. yeah. And like how to also like just the, f- you know, from so many different aspects of like raising financing and finding a producer and there's so much legal stuff that goes into it that they, that there's no class offered about any of that. And like, you know, back in point, like there's so much stuff that I've never mm-hmm. dealt with before. Um, so yeah, making making the feature was like a massive learning experience. Yeah, and this is your first feature. First feature. You yeah. did a real. I'm just gonna tell you, you did a really good oh, job for you. your first feature. Thank you, Gala. I know how difficult it is to make a movie. It was, it, yeah. It there was a lot. I mean, Kevin how, how was, long was, how long was your shoot? Fourteen days. Okay, yeah, that's a tight shoot. Um, fourteen days. Next to we didn't make it for anything. You, like no one really was getting paid what they should, should have been. It was yeah. you know, a lot well, of favors. Because everyone's there for the love of it. Yeah, like you can and it feel you can read it on the screen. You I can mean, tell that people are there because they want to be there. The majority of the crew was all from the shorts I've done, so they were you know they were game to do this first feature. Like I I don't think I would ever be able to make this feature again the way we did it because like i used all the favors for this <laughs> um well but it, no but if people had such a good time doing it they'll do right, the second one right. for sure um but no yeah 14 like you know pe- people are doing shorts these days for 14 days and, god there's someone um, my, a friend of mine goes to lmu and apparently they have like some students that are very very well off and it's like oh my mom's gonna give me a million dollars for my short film and i'm like i would love that yeah. i know my <laughs> mind's like, like i'm like exploding out of my head right there yeah it's so you had 14 day shoot how long did you have for prep and for post no i mean prep was prep was all over the place because it's we... like your entire life you're prepping for this <laughs> right i've been prepping for 30 years um no i mean there, there was a lot of pre-production was was very stressful like yeah there were i was like crying a lot i mean there it was everything was going wrong i mean for you know we were trying to make the movie for three years and every day for leading up to that you know an actor would drop out financing was falling through and you know we were so close to to doing it and like every day it was just something would go wrong and they don't teach you that in school like how to it's about putting fine yeah um but yeah, we weren't able to do like any rehearsals even because it was happening so fast. I mean, Jason signed on two weeks before we filmed. Wow, that's amazing! I didn't um, know that. Yeah, it was it, it was a, very stressful to even <laughs> to think. But I try not to think about that time yeah, honestly go, go because for, move forward, but, move forward. It is a, a massive lesson of like, you know, we were thinking about pushing at a certain time but we had so many you know pieces in place and i was like you know if we push we're never gonna film like we're at least gonna make this version of the film which was with no money 14 days but with the people i knew were available that i loved working with that you can trust right so yeah we did it but like the second we started production it was like the it was great like 14 days over over three weeks it was so yeah they were really next to no massive problems on set that's amazing which you know yeah uh i mean i think the biggest problem like i joke with the producers were like that at the gardena the curtains uh we they got stuck and judy (laughs) judy was very upset because we had we thought we had to get a a a curtain a specialist to fix the curtains Mm -hmm. and also like it, it just didn't look good if they were open the whole time and and like that was like the big, and we fixed it. But like that was, in my mind, like the biggest. Wow, obstacle. if that was the biggest yeah. obstacle, yeah. you were lucky. like we always made our day. Um, wow. I mean, there's even a deleted like we cut out a scene even that we filmed. So like, and I think it's because also I worked with the crew so many on so many shorts 
and the actors were all very professional and, and knew what they were doing that we were able to do it in 14 days. I still don't know how we did it, but yeah. That's amazing though. Okay. So I have to ask you because I've seen the movie and I hope right. that eventually people that are listening will have been able to, but I loved seeing it on the big screen and seeing all of your Easter eggs for your future projects that right. you want to yes. do. I think that's so smart to put in like your next movies in posters. Yeah. I, and ideally in the next one, there'll be the next even more Few, right and but even actually even at the movie theater itself there was the poster had, for yeah, yeah, next yeah, one yeah. on the but no yeah i knew you know so, so for all the listeners out there yeah. the, the in the movie there's fake movie posters for future films i want to do so one of them is aliens in aspen so there's a like a, a mock-up poster that i made that's in it and ideally, in Aliens and Aspen, there'll be, you know, future, I want to do something called the In Trilogy, uh, which is three films of uh, Aliens and Aspen, uh, Hell in the Hamptons, and Youth and University. Ideally, you'll see those. In posts. that order? Uh, yes, but maybe, you know, in this dream scenario, maybe a different film in between so <laughs> so i'm not just doing these three in movies back to back it's like the before trilogy right or if. so yeah it takes some time yeah it takes some time <laughs> but yeah so you'll see now you know hell in the hamptons poster in aliens and aspen and maybe now even stealing pulp fiction posters in in these films know, yeah. because the- you know i think the characters in these movies would like to see the other movies i like <laughs> that, that. Makes sense. it's like you're holding like- universe right the turquoise universe the pillar store social club maybe has a location yeah. in hamptons okay, so or the pillar store social club okay this social club that you guys came up with it's also yeah. your production company right right well so for the llc that we had to make for the film which is another thing they don't teach you yeah. anything about you know creating an llc but it was i had the, the lawyers were like you need to come up with the name and the, there's the pillar store social club is in the film anyway that I'll get get to but uh, I didn't have a lot of time to come up with the names so I was like oh you know Pillstorf makes sense and so then the company that I then created was Pillstorf Social Club which is nice then to use for the invites that you yeah, got for the invites yeah. and yeah um, but there was always going to be a social club aspect to the film because I felt like it was very funny for these kids to be be a member of a, a social, member club. Of social <laughs> club but the social club name uh, is a last name of someone my dad works with that I just loved the the name and I it's spelled differently and he the, he's happy about that the friend so uh, <laughs> but yeah there's not there's not much to it than me liking how Pillistorf sounded it sounded yeah um, well I love I also because I know that you love tennis yeah. and so when I saw in the movie they're playing tennis and not pickleball. Oh, never. Boo. Yeah, we never would play po- Sorry to all, you know, to all the I'm people. Not, I'm not sorry. But, um, but yeah, p- the tennis scene, it's also like, yeah, they're, they're using like, you know, the vintage rackets for some reason. and you know, It's a little bit displaced in time, just a little bit. Right, yeah. Even like, though we know that it's modern day because right. they're stealing Pulp Fiction but, from the, I'm putting in air quotes, the Bev. Right, but if you notice, there's no iPhones or anything. Which there's is such a breath of fresh air. It's also a yeah. breath of fresh air because when they're kind of going, not like, there's no mystery to the movie necessarily, but there is like a how are we going to do accomplish right. stealing the reels of Pulp Fiction? How are we going to get the gang together right. for our heist? Which, as I said before, I love crime gone right, gone right, wrong, right. gone right. Um, and I love, yeah, they're not using cell phones. They're not using, like, they're on their landlines. They're meeting up at the diner. It's how things should be. Right. They're not I, texting each other. Yeah, I hate the, I hope for all the future films I stick to that because I just hate iPhones in movies. Like, well, I think it's a cop-out, personally. Well, when you can like, just look something up on your phone. Like, yeah. you don't have to do any kind of, like, mental footwork in a yeah. movie. Yeah. But it's even like, but but like you said, like it's not necessarily, the, the film doesn't necessarily take place in the 90s or something, but they just so happen to be using landlines for some reason. Mm-hmm. So it's never really t- touched on. I mean, even <laughs> in Jonathan. Wooden Jonathan, rackets. Yeah, like, yeah, the wooden rackets maybe is, is a different thing. But even in Jonathan's bedroom, there's a whole cassette tape stuff. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the music is very retro and kind of 70s. Yeah, I just hate seeing it. And even in movies where they do the on-screen, 
texting texting i just it's a little better it's marginally better but it's not yeah. great it's got it yeah it's gotten kind of better but even like i don't know even a flip phone i'm okay with like well, that what was that was it it follows that had that weird clamshell phone that was like shaped like a clam yeah. and like but that was like kind of so far removed that it became okay yeah i mean what's the in the departed i feel like there's a lot of like the flip phone stuff for like yeah which is but that's which obviously makes in sense because yeah, it's that time but, period but no the flip the flip phone it's nice it's like a tactile thing yeah. you understand like what the phone is for right but like you know an iphone it's like it's better to have your characters on screen together talking well it's even like that the iphone somehow it also it dates the film in not a good way where like in 10 years even in one year they're gonna know right, what iphone was out right yeah so yeah, I hope I hope I never use iPhones. I I mean, you're the one that can decide that right, if yeah, you're writing yeah. and directing. Unless the studio is like, we have to put. You uh, must put I, in the new iPhone. iPhone. You or... are sponsored by iPhone. That is where your money is. I mean, coming even from. like when I see in movies like a MacBook Air with the Apple light, you know, illuminating. It's like it just it's, it's so jarring. Like that. So you want like technology removed because you don't want to be like jolted out of your movie experience, I guess. Right. At the same time, though. I'm sure people who've seen the movie were like, why are they using a landline? Actually, but, I didn't even think about that because like they use a landline, like he's at home, like he's baking. Home. Yeah. And so it kind of makes sense because like that's where a landline should be is at home. Right. But yeah, a corded landline. Yeah. You know, I haven't seen that really. No, be, not since they took out all the copper wiring. Right. But even like that was, you know, when I, I went to, you know, the Warner Brothers to do the prop stuff with the production designer and we just like, you know, would look through an aisle of landlines, you know, for God props is so fun. Yeah. It was, it was amazing. So and like, I don't think you would have the same joy of looking through a bunch of iPhones. <laughs> Look the same. I don't think you, would. um, with that being said, you know, maybe I don't want to shame Apple too much, but you know, maybe there's some collaboration. Uh, <laughs> They're giving you their money. Yeah. You're like this man, we will give it to yeah. him. So, who are your cinema? You mentioned Wes Anderson, but like cinematic forefathers, like who did you take from? Because you didn't really take from Quentin, and I think a lot of people with the title are going to assume that like this is like an yeah. homage to Pulp Fiction, right. which it is, but Pulp Fiction isn't really shown in the movie at all. Right. I think I was very a few things. I was like very adamant about I can get it could get dicey going too far into that world of Tarantino because it's my first film and if it's basically a Tarantino film then it's like well who is this filmmaker yeah and you do have and, homage to him I right. mean like the Kill Bill sword is in the right the therapist boxing room right yeah there's there's <laughs> some things that I knew would be too easy like I, I was like we're not doing a trunk shot like that's too easy I yeah think, you know, but I you feel, did the briefcase we did the briefcase which yeah that was pretty, <laughs> which is funny though yeah. I, which I, also I, like at the end of the day doesn't doesn't make any sense in the movie but it was just oh, like, it totally makes sense. Well, well like the, the fact that like it's the lighting that, up and yellow. The fact that, that guy is like the one that's buying the reels. Right. <laughs> but, um, yeah, no, tr I mean, we, I was like, all right, we have to put some feet in, but we're not going to go too far into the feet aspect. Mm -hmm. But I mean, yeah, as far as like the, the style and look, I was like, I, I, I knew that if it was too easy to go too far into the Tarantino thing and mm -hmm. it wouldn't feel like my own movie at the end of the day. And then even the Wes Anderson aspect, I was like, I really want to stay away from doing things that Wes Anderson would do. Well, yeah, because uh, it's very Wes Anderson then, and you are Danny Turkowitz. Right. So You're I wanted it to feel yeah. like a Turkowitz film. Yeah. And even throughout, like, you know, throughout the whole film, too, that it was consistent, because I knew even, I don't know, when we were planning the film, there were some sequences that were like, this maybe feels like to Wes Anderson or Tarantino, and... But so it was, a, it was a nice, like, how do we make this feel like it's a new voice? Mm -hmm. uh, so hopefully that came across. I think but. it did. And also you had a lot of really great comedic aspects. I mean, okay, listen, I grew up with Pulp Fiction basically kind of being like this, like, specter that was always hanging on yeah. to me i didn't see the movie until i was 18 a lot of people think i probably well, grew up with it it's a very vulgar it's a very vulgar and my dad was really strict about r-rated movies yeah. uh, i didn't watch any like r-rated until i was 
18. Right. Well, except for like all the scary <laughs> 70s right. movies that yeah. he thrust upon me. But like I'm a little bit apprehensive about like when people send me like Pulp Fiction or like Tarantino material watching it. And I right. think I did have a little bit of apprehension. Yeah, you waited, along. I think. <laughs> You know, a long time many <laughs> until a certain event <laughs> yeah. happened. And Fine, then... <laughs> I'll watch your movie. Uh, but no, and yeah. I loved it, like yeah. because it's it's an homage to it, but it's not jerking it off, right? For lack of a better word, right? It, it was in in the way too, like the reason I really thought. Yeah, you know, I think I told you this. Like, I me, mean, I went to the new Bev. Yeah, and I, I, saw, and I loved this. Yeah, it because. When I he, first, you, had, you had to preface me. I'm not a crazy Tarantino fan. Yeah, I'm like, fan. listen, I don't even like Paul. No. Um, <laughs> but I don't know, like one of the first things I did when I moved to L.A. with my friend Benny, who was one of the kids I went to film camp with, we went to a midnight screening of Pulp Fiction at the New Bev. And I just couldn't believe what was like. The, everyone was like as if they were seeing like the Rolling Stones. Or so, you know, it was like the vibe there was crazy. And it was midnight. And not that that's very late. But, but the movie's really long. And the movie, yeah. So, and they do this intro similar to how they do it in the film where they're like, we got a treat for you guys. And yeah. like, I, I've never. It is Quentin Tarantino's personal and they really 35 do it. millimeter print. They really say that. And the crowd goes crazy as if they're saying that he's there. Like it's. And sometimes he is. Yeah. And, but I remember like very vividly just looking around thinking like. What, like why is everyone freaking out right now <laughs> and i and i and you know the movie started playing and it really did change the way that i watched the whole i mean i've seen it before but the way that i've watched it in that setting knowing somehow not that it really changed anything that this was tarantino's like print mm-hmm. and and i mean you know, at the time i was like didn't really know what that meant honestly i was thinking like that it's valuable that there is that people clearly are jazzed up about this and i said to my friend benny i was like it's a movie theater like there's obviously no security here for this thing (laughs) like you (laughs) theoretically can kind of just go up to the booth and say give me the the reels and walk out and and you would then have it and like what you would do with it i don't know and like that's part of the movie of like why are you even stealing this but yeah, instead of obviously doing that, I, I made a, the short first and then... Uh, yeah, the, instead of going up to the booth and attacking <laughs> right. David up there. Right. Thank you. Sorry, David. For, you know. But uh, but yeah, it was... And then I, so I made the short. It was very clear that people found that idea funny of like stealing Tarantino's print. And I never really thought I would make it into a feature. I just thought it was like a really funny idea. And... Yeah, here you are. And here we are on the Gala Show. Yeah. <laughs> here we are. Yeah. No, I just, I also just think it's like really cool because a lot of people also don't understand like what a print is. Like how yeah. you were saying like when you kind of like first, like you didn't really comprehend. I'm sure you knew what a print was. Right. But like a lot of people nowadays are not as lucky as we are to have repertory theaters that are screening right. film on film. Right. Like for them. So. But even like, you know, to be honest, to this day, I'm still not quite sure, you know, Tarantino's personal print really kind of what that actually means. It's like, does it, it, when it's not at the new Bev, it's in his, is it in his house? Yeah. Well, it's like in like his like store. I'm getting information for the follow up. Yeah. So, you know. <laughs> no, it's like, I think he has like a storage area because he has a lot of prints because the yeah. Bev has prints and then sometimes they get like loans. Right. So it's like, I don't actually, I don't know if the Bev has that many prints. I think they do like a lot of like loaning and like shuffling. Cause right. like prints will go from like the Academy to the Bev to the yeah. Vista to et cetera. Well, now, yeah. Et cetera. Now the Vista is in the, the Vista. circulation. To... But no, that, that is his print. It is his, it is what he got after he made the movie. I mean, I hope that this film inspire someone to maybe actually oh, steal it. it better uh, not full disclaimer do not go up there <laughs> because not, uh, you might get pepper spray yeah, yeah. well now there's apparently secure they heard about the film there's security there they actually do there, have security the bev now yeah there is a, there's a guy beck, outside well yeah but also beck has a nightstick oh i heard you hear that everyone yeah, i heard <laughs> once that um during um not brown bunny um during gummo 
Okay. The gummo screening yeah. apparently was wild there, and they had a group of kids trying to sit on the floor in front of the front row. Well, you know what theater allows that now? What theater? Vidiots. It's a whole party. Wait, in the Vidiots front. lets you sit. You, they let the you floor? do it. Yeah, they let. You, I mean, but Vidiots also doesn't run film. Vidiots only runs digital because their zoning for like the fire or something won't let yeah. them run film. Yeah, but they have alcohol. <laughs> so alcohol and the front row floor. Yeah, I mean, when are they you the... there, like drunk, no. rolling around on the floor? <laughs> Going there tonight? Uh, no, they did it. I don't know if they do it for everybody, but for the when they did the Talking Heads re uh, run, um, there's like a dance party in the front. Wow. Um, I know they and... just had uh, Paul Williams there. They they have some great for Cinco de Mayo. Yeah, they've got some great. They they do a lot of good. Stuff. I, I honestly I haven't been yet. To be I honest, haven't so. I haven't been either, yeah. so it's fine. Um, but. Yeah, that's that's movies in LA. But I hope no one goes up to the the booth and tries to steal the Pulp Fiction. Well, now it's fun that he has the Vista now too. So now yeah. it's like the universe. The options is expanded. are yeah, the <laughs> options are, are twice as, as large now twice that you large. can steal something from the Vista. But they have the co- I haven't been to the coffee shop there yet. I did before it, before it opened though. Okay. So not I guess not technically. Right. But yeah. Yeah, I gotta I go to Pam's coffee. coffee. Yeah, well, you love yeah. coffee. <laughs> yeah. Is that your other vice? Coffee, yeah. sports, coffee, sports, coffee, film, film. That's, That's it. About <laughs> it. <yeah. laughs> so, what's next? Well, so we're looking to, for to get this. Aspen? Yeah, well, yeah. You know, first we're looking to get this distributed, this stealing Pulp Fiction out there into the world. Have someone steal it. <laughs> I almost <laughs> did. I almost did at the stealing, screening. Stealing Pulp Fiction. It's I know. The follow up. No. It's the follow up. <laughs> but yeah, ideally, you know, I wrote Aliens and Aspen already, and I, the goal was to, oh. What's your goal? Are you just like oh, the goal is not not gonna tell you. So that's that's all you ha- you got me for. Um, I mean, yeah, the goal is as crazy as it sounds. Is if in an ideal world is to film it in the winter of. In Aspen. Not in Aspen. That would, but well, ideally in Aspen, <laughs> but you know, we're going to maybe somewhere like Montana or, I mean, there's even, cause it, it takes place basically all at the hotel. Um, so we can kind of cheat it for anywhere with, you know, even tax incentives they don't teach you in films, you know, yeah, it's like, just like, what is it like Louisiana or Georgia has like a really good one right now? I mean, yeah. Aspen would just be too expensive, unfortunately, but um but yeah you know tr- if we're trying to do it in january february march of 2025 like things kind of need to start <laughs> get that ramping up look for the best tax incentive yeah. to be honest i think it's louisiana that has a really good one right now we'll but follow they might up be, after yeah, we'll follow after <laughs> <laughs> and that is all the time that we have for today but danny is there any final thought that you'd like to leave the audience with final thought well Clearly, don't try and steal prints from movies. <laughs> you know, that's they have weapons now at the theaters. To, 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 uh, but now, yeah, thank you for having me, Gala. Um, thank you for coming. Always on. a pleasure. <laughs> yeah, that was always a pleasure. Uh, and keep a lookout for Stealing Pulp Fiction coming to hopefully a theater near you in in October for the thirtieth anniversary. Anniversary, That'd be which. Great. We didn't talk about this. I was born in 94. Were you born on the day that Pulp Fiction well, came out? Born, no. <laughs> no. No, no, no. I was born in October. Later, I, th- I think it's early October it came out. I think it's like the 10th? Yeah. I knew the exact day. I didn't want to say. Is I don't, it I the 10th? Yeah. I don't, oh, want to, I... <laughs> I don't want to seem to. Uh, it's 10-10. Um, but yeah, 30. I'm turning 30 this year. Pulp Fiction turns 30. Oh my God. You are. Could be a crazy year. Could be a crazy <laughs> year. When's your birthday? 26. October 26. Okay. Yeah. Scorpio. Scorpio. Yeah. Yep. Well, yeah. thank you to my guest, Danny Turkowitz, for coming onto the show. If you'd like to keep up with Danny, you can do so on Instagram at Danny Turkowitz. And hopefully, Stealing Pulp Fiction will be available for viewing. But until then, keep up with the Pillisdorf Social Club on Instagram at Pillisdorf Social Club for updates on the film. I'm Gala Avery, and this has been The Gala Show. The Gala Show is brought to you by Insertomatic. This episode was executive produced by Roger Avery and produced by Gala Avery. Music composed by Andy Milburn. As always, I'm your host, Gala Avery. Copyright 2023, all rights reserved.
despite me sharing the same last name with this charity, I don't have any affiliation with it, besides the fact that the issue is very near and dear to my heart. Did you know that in the United States, 2.7 million children currently have a parent in prison, and it's estimated that 10 million children have experienced parental incarceration at some point in their lives. I was one of these kids, and as an adult, I am really grateful to be able to give back to Project Avery. Their mission is to build leadership from within by supporting community through programs such as mentoring and outdoor education, and also to remove the stigma surrounding having a parent that's incarcerated. You don't have to feel alone. If you know a kid who could use these resources or would like to donate money or time to the charity, please go to Project Avery, that's A-V-A-R-Y dot org, to check out what this amazing charity is all about. Again, that's projectavery.org. Thank you guys from the bottom of my heart.